Uh, Galatians 5, 22, 23 is our text. So we'll bounce all around with it, but, but that's our primary text for our study on the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith. Yours probably says faithful. It doesn't say that. It says faith. Uh, gentleness and self-control against such there is no law. So we're looking at the first one, which is uh, the fruit of love. And I'll show you today. Um, that it uh, is singular. The fruit of the Spirit is the word. Of course, you got an is with it, but the fruit of the Spirit, it, it's singular. It's nominative singular. And it introduces, and that's going to be true with air, all nine fruit. <laughs> You know, it's hard to write that and not be corrected. My computer wants to correct me all the time when I write. The fruit of the Spirit is, and then list them. They want to come back and tell me that you should have an R there because we, and I, I you should have an S on the fruit, and there's not one, so it, it's all the time messing with me. Uh, this is our third study. We're now into engaged, but I spent three, we spent two lessons on teaching you three important doctrines that make the fruit of the Spirit important. It w they will not work unless you understand that, in my opinion. You have to understand that we live in the church age and every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And notice in Galatians 5.22, the fruit is of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, and all. And, and that's really important. Because listen, every one of these terms the world uses. The world uses every one of these terms. This, they use the same vocabulary that we use. But their source is different. The source for this the love of God as it was created by God and given a vocabulary name by God is a divine attribute. It, it, we all know, when we study the essence box, we always put the love of God in it. We put the love of God in it. <clears throat> the world doesn't. <laughs> The world, when they use the word love, they don't put God in it. It's not relevant to them. For the church of Jesus Christ, for the believer, God is everything to love. If you try to love, if you want to know what love is at 100% capacity, it is the fruit, it is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But the world uses these terms. And so we have to know, they, they, and it means the same thing to them, but it has a different source. In other words, once you understand the source, it'll change how you view it. Because the love of the world comes from the flesh. It doesn't come from the Spirit of God. So that's important that we understand the indwelling Holy Spirit uh, makes us able to bring love into its creative 100% form. When you love and the Holy Spirit produces love in your life, it's at 100% capacity of how it was created to be. Because the Holy Spirit does it. Well, the essence of God is the same essence for Jesus as the same essence of the Holy Spirit. Right? Same essence. We call it the Godhead, or others call it the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three different persons, but the same essence. So it's important when we see the Holy Spirit producing love, it is the love of God. It is the love of Christ. It is the love of the Holy Spirit. It's 100% divine, 0% human, 100% divine. comes from you, but not through your power. 
It comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. It comes through you, but not through your flesh. It comes through the Holy Spirit. So it's important that you understand that. And therefore, the second thing that's important is how to, you must learn to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. You must learn to walk. All of these things are produced by the Holy Spirit when you walk in the Spirit. When you walk in the Spirit. And that's a command. You know, it's a peripateo. And it, peripateo means in every area of your life. There's no... If you go into a closet, then it's there. If you come out of a closet, it's there. You got to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit no matter where you are. And that, and that, it's in a command mood, it's in a command form, therefore it requires your volition. It's a command, right? You don't have to if you don't want to, but God desires it and God <coughs> commands it of you. So that, that's the second thing. The third thing is the filling ministry. The filling ministry is the word play role. It means to fill up a deficiency in us. The world can use the word love, but it can't fill up a deficiency of it. In other words, love always meets a need in another person's life. The flesh can't, can't meet that need. In fact, it feeds on it. It feeds on it. I mean, that's what movies are about. It feeds on it. You ever said that? Well, I think, gosh, you know, now you've had that experience in your life. And, and uh, so the filling of the ministry, with the filling ministry, the word play role means to fill up a deficiency. And the only way you can fill up the deficiency of love is let the Holy Spirit do it. You can't do it. You, there is no power in man to do that. And that's going to be true with all nine fruit. So those three things are really important. If you haven't studied, you ought, to, you ought to go back and pick these studies up. I guess they're online somewhere. Are they online? Well, don't, go to our, don't go to the website to get it. Find somebody who's got notes. Uh, to study. So I want to look at four things today about love, the fruit of love, which is agape. It, you'll find a word on your paper. In the Greek, it's called agape. The word love is the same word that the world uses. That Listen to me now. What's different about it? When a Christian does it, if he does it right, the source is different. When the world says love, it comes from the flesh. When the Christian says love, it comes from the Holy Spirit, if he's doctrinally taught. Right? All right. Be careful how you use that word. Because it requires some responsibility. Oh, well. The first fruit, love, establishes a doctrinal principle of singular. The first word out, love, is singular. It's nominative singular, and that's really important. I wrote it on your paper. I wanted you to get a look at it in the Greek language. When he uses the word but, it's used day. It's a conjunction of contrast. It's very similar to the therefore. Sometimes day as a conjunction is a connection to something previous to it, or it and it can be in contrast to it. That's a trailer and that's a truck. It can be in contrast and yet still be linked. The trailer's not a truck. It won't, drive, won't go on its own, but if you've got a truck, you can haul it. So when this is used, day here is what we call a conjunction of contrast. Now watch this. He's going to contrast the spirit versus the flesh. If you walk in the flesh versus if you walk in the spirit. Now watch this. If you'll go back to verse 19 where this thing started and, and is connected day, you're going to see the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the spirit. In verse 19, now the deeds of the flesh are evident immorality, fornication, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy and drunkenness, carousing, and things like this. <laughs> I mean, he got tired of listening to them. I mean, he li that's, that's in his church. He's listed all the people in his church. Uh, apparently, he, he wants us to continue that list in ours. 
these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Watch this. But the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? Watch this now. We got the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. And that little day on the front of that word is a conjunction of contrast. And you can't, and he's saying, listen, if you think you can produce these positive ideas, love, joy, peace, patience, in the flesh, you can't. It don't have the power to do it. Right? It takes the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. The, the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. See that? That little word, day. In my Bible, it said now, now in verse 19, and then in verse 22, but. But the fruit. See, that, that's, a, that's a D E, and it's a conjunction of contrast. That, that, that's important because he set up. If you think these thing, these nine fruit can be produced in the, in the flesh. And he told you how what the flesh produces. Right? They, they're not going to be able to do this. This is why you need the Holy Spirit. Right? And so he gives he gives you a whole list of negatives in your life. You go, you go in the flesh, this is what you get. You go in the spirit, this is what you get. But you can't get them from your flesh. You can get the others from your flesh, but you can't get these from the flesh. And yet the flesh uses the word love, joy, peace, patience, God, don't they? I mean, how many times? I don't know. Okay, so this little verse has set up a contrast between 19 through 21, 22 and 23, or all the way to 25. There's a point of contrast. The fruit, see, I put the fruit there. Notice the whole. That's a, that's a definite article. There, the word the should be on that. And then karpos. And karpos is a production. It's what the, that's a cherry tree. It should produce cherries. That's an apple tree. It ought to produce apples. In other words, it has a fruit product. It's a divine production. Love is a divine production. That's the word, that's the idea of a fruit. Well, if you have a cherry tree, where do you think it came from? Where do you think the origin is? Creation. Oh, well. So, but the fruit with a definite article, and then watch, see the NSM on your paper? That's nominative singular masculine. All right? The word fruit is nominative, right? The fruit of the Spirit, and... Uh, the, of the Spirit is an ablative. Now, I'm, a t I'm telling you why that's important. I don't expect that that's going to be a gate question. All right? When you get to the pearly gates, he probably won't ask you that. But listen, listen to me. Let me tell you why I have to tell you this. Because this is an ablative of source. Source. That's why it's of. The fruit is of the source, the only source in your life that can produce 100% divine production of love is the Holy Spirit of God. And you got it as a gift. You didn't earn it, didn't deserve it, you can't lose it. Right? The indwelling. See that ablative? Did you write is the source? Ablative of source. I don't think I wrote source. I did. Oh, man. Oh, man. I spoil you people. Notice a definite article on the word spirit, T-O-U. That's a definite article with emphasis on identity. Notice we had a definite article with fruit. We have a definite article with the Holy Spirit with an ablative of source. There's no other source. This fruit comes from this source. Love comes from the Holy Spirit. That is 100% the product that God designed for your life. God designed you to have the love of God in your soul. And it's good for you and it's good to give others. All right? It's a, it's a fruit that gets on, keeps on 
giving. It's a gift that keeps on giving. All right, so we have that. We uh, the absolute sort, the ablative. See, that's ablative singular neuter. That's an absolute source. In other words, this love that I'm talking about is a hundred percent God and zero percent man. You understand? It comes from you, but it has nothing to do with you, right? Other than you're the vehicle. The Holy Spirit produces it. 100% produces the divine love of God. And when it does, when the Holy Spirit produces it to another person, it fills up a deficiency of a need for that specific kind of love. It is not to get a Coca-Cola. Yeah, what well, makes the world go around? Well, anyhow. But the fruit of the Spirit is, I mean, I mean is an absolute status quo verb of existence. Is. It's called an absolute status quo verb of existence. Is. Look, you is here. <laughs> you is here. That's an and that's a hundred percent existent. Where were you the other day? Meaning you weren't here. You weren't in existence with me. You weren't existing someplace else, but John here. The fruit of the spirit. The the fruit of the spirit. And he gives the first one is love. That's not the only one, is it? But he put it first. Put it first. Put it first in the chain. Put it first in the chain. As, and we're going to talk about why he did that today. Notice it's a present active indicative. It's always this. It is always the source. The source of the Holy Spirit always produces it at 100%. The need of the other person or you, it fills, a de fills up a deficiency for love in your life. It fills up a deficiency in somebody else's life. Love. You ought to be given as much of that away as you can because you have an ample supply of it in the Holy Spirit who could not leave you and he's the only one who could produce it. You ought to be the wishing well of love. <laughs> That's what you ought to be. We all ought to be. Now, see the word love? On your paper, see the word love? See, it's not a long sentence, is it? It's not a long thing, but here's what's important. That's a predicate, That's a predicate nominative. You see, see the word the fruit? That's a nominative, singular. See the word love? That's nominative, singular. See that? A predicate nominative means that the word fruit and love are interchangeable. They are one and the same. You understand that? It's a predicate nominative. In other words, it, it the fruit is love. Okay, there you you can't have one without the other. It's what it is. It's a predicate nominative. In, in other words, it identifies the subject, but it works off a verb. It's a predicate nominative. I don't mind working for my meal, but I haven't eaten yet. I don't mind working for it. Okay, now so listen. I introduced this this way to you because this is the introduction to every fruit. We're going to go from love to joy. We're, he's not going to come back and explain it again. I will, but he won't. I mean, it's, going to be, it's going to be love, and it's going to be joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, right? Faith and gentleness and what's the last one? Self-control. Uh, we could use a little of that, couldn't we? Uh, Self-control. Now, here's a doctrinal principle. This is, this is what one of the things you should work, learn when you walk away from here today. This love that we're talking about that comes from the Holy Spirit through the life of a believer, this love is part of the essence and the production of the Godhead. Right? You know John 3, 16? It was working through Jesus. It was working through God. For God so loved the world that he gave, right? You know the, you know the drill, right? 
It is the essence of God, 100%. It's the essence of Christ, 100%. It's the essence of the Holy, 100%. Right? That's a very important principle. See, we're not talking about the love of the world. We're talking about the love of God. So that's, it. that's important. The second doctrinal principle that you should get, walk away with today is the indwelling Holy Spirit. Is it a permanent residence? When he comes in, does he stay? How do you know that? John 14, 16, 17 would be one that when he comes in, he's not permitted to leave. He has to ride it out with you. And boy, think how many times that ship went down and come back up. He's got to ride. He's got to ride the course with you. Listen, when he left heaven, he was told to walk with you. Now you're told to walk with him. He was commanded, you, you're going to enter him and you're going to walk him out of this life. Isn't that wonderful? And that, what a wonderful walk that will be if you let him walk you through your life. And, and, and part of that is the love part of essence and production of the Godhead. The indwelling Holy Spirit is the absolute source, 100% God, one, zero man, right? Where does it come from? Where does love come from in the Christian life? If it comes at all, where does it come from? The indwelling Holy Spirit. Uh, 30%? Uh, 99%? 100%. All right. And that's important. God defines, yeah. Uh, can you talk about for a second for a believer that certain scripts are similar to it? I will before I get through. <laughs> you jumped ahead of me, my man. God defines his love, the world doesn't. All right? God defines it. So, since you ask, <laughs> let's go to let's go to first John. You got your body there, boy. Go to 1 John, look at chapter 2, verse 15 of uh, 17. Uh, the other Austin, 1 John 4, 20. Landon, you got your Bible with you? Okay. Let's go to Matthew 6, 24. We're going to get a look at this thing. We're going to get a look at it. All right? So here we are in... I don't think any of this is on your paper. I, I wrote this this morning. First uh, John two fifteen through seventeen. Listen to this. Read loud. Read, read loud for me. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. Do not what? Love the world. Uh, love the what? World. Okay, got that. What else? Nor the things in the world. Oh, whew. now that got me. I thought I was safe with don't love the world. But now he said, or, or the things in the world, right? Boy, that's a, that's a garbage full of stuff. Go ahead. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. How about that? Huh? Now, what's in, what's in you is the Holy Spirit, Right? See, what we're after is having the love of the Holy, right? The love the Holy Spirit can produce in me. The world can't produce it. The world cannot produce it. All right, go ahead. Pick me back up there. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's yeah, see, it's not functional in him, right? If you're going to the world, the, then the... The, the, the love of God can't work in your life because you filled your life with things with the world. You love the world and the things of the world. And, and you've sidetracked. You've, you've made God get... I'm not a welcome passenger. Go ahead. For all that is in the world... Oh, here we got a description of everything in the world. Yeah. And the lust of the eyes. Yeah. And the boastful pride of life. Yeah, that's what's attached to all these things in the world. All right? That's what you're pursuing. What what else? It is not from the Father. 
Huh? It is from the world. But it is from the world. What verse was that? That was verse uh, 16 of oh. 1 John 2. Give me one more. Verse 17. The world is passing away, and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Yeah, this whole world's passing away, but the love of God exists forever. So why wouldn't you do the thing? Why don't you pursue the things of God, which last forever, rather than the things of the world that's um, temporal, fleeting? Here we are in First John four twenty. First John is a great book on this thing of love and the conflict over it. First John, First John's a great book on the, on the love of God and the conflict over it. Here we go. Yeah? Do you say that? Okay. If anyone says, I love God. Do you say that? I'm kidding with you. Well, I would say it. Uh huh. If I gave you a chance. <laughs> I, I got that. I got that, movie director. This next part is not What did he contra- what did he what did he contrast love to? Mm-hmm. Isn't that interesting? What would you have? I was going to ask you this, but I I I didn't. What would you contrast it with? There'd be a lot of different ideas, but he gave you one. Here we are in Matthew six something. What was it, son? Twenty four. Read loud now. Wait, what? There's only two, right? How many did he list? What did he say? He said two. All right. I just wondered if he said the same thing in your Bible. There's a guy who's been in my Bible study before. <laughs> he paused for me to get, give me a shot, didn't he? That yeah, good, Landon. Watch, it's either the world of God. He called it mammon. Either world, the things that the things in the world that you would treasure, mammon, the things of the world that you would. Uh, put a high price on that you would treasure. Watch what he says. Watch the conflict. Read again for me. I won't interrupt you. Re- read the whole thing again. Yeah. Yeah. It's one or the other, isn't it? It's one or the other. It's one or the other. That was Matthew six twenty four. See, it's kind of interesting that God challenges the thing that challenges love is hate. Yeah. He's not just talking about love as money. He's talking about no, it's the things that you prize out there that God says, "Huh, oh, don't do that." It's the things you left God to go out there and get. Yeah, you know, all your buddies say you ought to come with me. You got it. What you're going to do? We're going to get in trouble. Hmm. We're going to get in trouble. We're going to go to jail tonight, probably. Come on, we'll have fun. We're, 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 yeah. So I have a question about like love, like if you're significant other. But I think like okay, so what about there's this couple who's been unbelievers their entire life, but they've been together their entire life. They can make love. Yeah. So like. So. Like, what's, so if if they stay, listen, and that could be from a worldly standpoint, couldn't it? The world can love one another. But if you introduce God into that couple, one of them gets saved. And God comes, God comes into that relationship. Now we got a problem. You understand that? How are they, how are they going to be, how, how, what are the possibilities of conflict 
based on what you read to me. Yeah, or hold on to one and despise the other. See, that's the problem we have with it. With two unbelievers, they could get along very well if they're both in agreement on what love is from a world standpoint. Well, if one gets saved and they open the Bible and the Bible goes like cha-ching, then they got a cha-ching problem. That's right. Well, that's the hope, isn't it? That's that's the hope. The, well, yeah, they got it. Yeah, they, yeah. Why? Well, yeah, the believer may not buy into you got to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, but if he does, I mean, yeah. Well, yes. Give it back to me, guys. Give it back to me. See, if the world will put conditions on you. The world will put conditions on you. Right? The world will put their own ideas and conditions on you. This one, when God talks about it, he talks about unconditional love. You don't expect anything from the other person that warrants or guarantees or would, would motivate you to love them. Well, I love them, but I don't love this other person. You, that's not it, is it? No, that, you don't do that. Um, so, when you go to, I want to show you something. Go to Romans, uh, go w w to Romans with me to the eighth chapter. I want to show you something that's interesting in the, in the, in the Greek language. It's interesting in the Greek language. Ooh. Anybody's windows down? Eight. Uh, nine through eleven. I want to show you something. Uh, I'm in Romans eight, nine through eleven. He says. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong in him. See those words, if? Every one of them, every, every one of them in verses 8, 9, 10, and 11, every one of them is a first class condition. The first one that's listed is listed in the Greek language as a particle. It's listed as E-I-P-E-R. But that's that E-I makes that a first class condition. And, and so, and when you have every if, and if it's a first class condition, did you get your car? Take the car. Your car. Uh, did you roll up everybody's windows out there? Yeah. <laughs> you came in awful dry to be able to do that. Um, a first class condition means and is true and, and they're in every they're markers right if you was you know I tell you when you read a passage you look for markers <clears throat> well it, it, these are markers every one of them well, look at I'm back at nine However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. And he's going to explain it. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. The moment you accept the gospel of Christ, you belong to Christ, the Holy Spirit enters in your life. Right? And the first class condition, this is true. If you, if you believe in the gospel of Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, is what he's saying. That's an absolute. And then, it, and the, see those ifs, those ifs, if anyone does not have it, th this is a truism. That's not a bank. This is the Word of God. And if Christ, there's another first, that's another first class. If Christ is in you, and he is in you, right? If you belong to him because you have accepted the gospel. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit, human spirit, is alive because of righteousness. That's positional righteousness. 
That's second, you know, like say, like Romans eight, uh, Romans five twenty one, Second Corinthians five twenty one. Now watch verse eleven. We got that word if again. That's a first class. Which means, tell me what a first class means. And it's true. And it's true. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he did, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life, that's eternal life, that's the abundant life of God in you, will give life to your mortal body. What does mortal mean? Liable to death. Yeah, liable to death. He, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the, through his spirit who indwells you. See, there's two common themes here in 9, 10, and 11. The first class condition and the indwelling. It's in every verse, the indwelling, the indwelling, the indwelling. Right? I mean, that's... And so I put that on your paper for you to pay attention to. Right? Um, Austin, give me First John 4, 7. I don't think I put this on your paper. A, beloved. What a wonderful word. Do you know who the beloved Son of God is? Jesus Christ. He's called the beloved Son of God. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you become a beloved Son of God in Christ. Do what? Yes. Yeah, that's a clue. Mm -hmm. beloved and you know what that means listen let me tell you what that means to you it means that you're the object of God's maximum love from the moment you got saved to forever you're the object of God's maximum love well why would God do this to me because he loves you why would God do that because he loves you he loves you when things are going good and when things aren't going good he always loves you how do I know it? Because he calls me the beloved son. In Christ, I'm a beloved son. That's a pretty powerful idea. Because listen to me. He was the beloved son. And that beloved son, he hung on a cross to be the propitiation for my sin. To take the wrath judgment of God for sin upon himself for me. So that I could become called a beloved son. That's a heavy price. I don't know that we appreciate it as much as we should. Beloved. Here we go back. We didn't get through. Beloved. Beloved. Let us love one another. For love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Oh, gosh. Point number three. At the point of believing the gospel of grace salvation, the indwelling Holy Spirit, watch this now, pours out the love of God into our church-age believer's heart. Every person at the moment of salvation, the love of God is poured out, poured out into the human heart. It fills the human heart. And listen, just like your heart pumps blood, you know, it pump it. This love is going to pump it out of you from the day of your birth to the day of the rapture of Jesus Christ until the day of redemption. Isn't that wonderful? That's a wonderful idea. And so we have Romans 5 5. Hope does not disappoint because. See, people were getting disappointed over hope. They had a misunderstanding of it, didn't they? You know, hope's not, not in our, our nine. Paul put it in, in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, though. Right? The great, but he said the greatest of these, faith, hope, and the greatest of them was. All right. 
Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Romans later down, a couple verses down, he says, but God demonstrated his own love towards us. Did you love that? I kept all those. His, listen, I love this when I hear this. God demonstrated his own love towards us. See, that's John 3, 16 in the reality of the cross. How did God demonstrate his love towards us? He hung his son on a cross. Watch this. For, for, for my, for, while I was a sinner under, under the need of propitiation, I was under the, a sinner under the wrath of God. Uh, while we were yet sinners, huh? Yet sinners. We're all sinners until we get saved. Then we're all saints. I know. I know. I'm just telling you positionally. You ought to write this down. We won't read it. Austin's getting tired of reading. First uh, John four sixteen. You know what it says? The love I'm talking about, John says, is the essence of God. I'm talking about the love of the essence of God. He, he says in First John four sixteen. Most of you that are familiar with it, with the, the essence of God. God is love. Knows First John four sixteen is one of the great quotes. It, it's a very simple verse, one that we could all remember. God is love. <laughs> That's not hard, is it? Point number four. The church age believer can never be separated. Can never be separated. Can never be separated from the love of God poured out in us as the eternal gift of God's grace salvation. Never separated. Oh, you don't believe it. You get it. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Don't listen to those people tell you that you can be separated from the love of God. It's impossible. Let me tell you how impossible it is. In jo in uh, John fourteen sixteen seventeen, the Holy Spirit can't leave you, right? And He's the source of it. In Romans the eighth chapter twenty eight through thirty nine, which is a great good read for you, not now but later. Listen. In Romans 8.35, in this great passage, Paul asked a question, then answered it. He said, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Then he proceeded to mention seven things and then gave a conclusion. He mentioned seven things that cannot. And the church was all, all, all screwed up in their head over it. Right? So he mentions the seven. They're all, uh, well, you could if you did this. You could if you did that. could if you did that. He went, well, the seven you guys are worried about, let me list them and tell you, <clears throat> it never happened. Right? So and you can go back and study this stuff. I'm just, so he makes a conclusion. He mentions seven that the church is struggling with about losing the love of God, separ being separated from the love of God. He said, and he lists seven the church was struggling with, and he said, but in, and his conclusion was in verse 37, he said, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. That's Christ. You always have the love of Christ. You always have the love of Christ. It is poured out in you the moment you believe the gospel of Christ. Now that people lie to you. Then he does something interesting. He gives 10 more in that same passage. Watch what he does. Then he gave 10 more and gave a conclusion. He gave 10 more and he lists 10 more. Now, how many is that? All right. Anybody keeping up with that? So we got 10 more and then he makes this conclusion. I am convinced that these things shall not be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, if that list is not long enough for you, just come up with some more because the answer is always going to be the same, isn't it? Well, I bet this could. We'll write it down. I bet this could. We'll write it down. You're not going to get any points for it because the answer is simple. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Christ died one death to bring you into the family, and you're there forever. Don't let people lie to you. My, my, my. Whip, whip the word out on them. 
Put their word on this stuff, right? He said, well, can you help me understand this one? And they'll come up with some goofy stuff. And then whatever they come up and say you could lose, just add it to the list you already have, right? Because the conclusion is always going to be the same. He quit at something, 18 or 19, he quit, right? Because he made a point to the church. What can separate you from the love of God? Nothing. My, my, my. I don't know what he's saying. In John, in the first John, the third chapter, verse 1. I don't know, I keep hearing things outside. Maybe the Lord's come back and left us. No. <laughs> Let's say, I th I'm looking for a trumpet and a shout, not lightning and thunder. Uh, watch, watch what John does. John, John's an interesting writer in himself. Well, hey. Uh, well, I'm glad to have you come. Well, that's good. Sam, good to have you, Sam. I went to... Yeah, you guys go over there. Go over and grab you something. We're, go over there and eat. We're going to... Yeah, you guys eat. We'll, we'll continue our study. We're, we're nearly through. Uh, we, we go to one. Now, John does something interesting here. Listen, look how he introduced this idea. He said, see how great... Do you see how great... Do you see how great... Of course, John is writing this. Now we're in the third chapter of John. See, first John is just dynamite about the love of God. By now you know that. But he's been, now he's in the third chapter. He's in the third chapter. He opens up with verse 1. He says, he, he's taught chapter 1 and chapter 2. And he says, now do you see how great a love the Father has? Do you see how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us? Chapters 1 and 2. That's good read right there. And what does he mean by see? Do you now see how great a love? I mean, he's been teaching. And do you not get it? Do you not get it? That's what we've been after today with you. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it didn't know him. All right? Well, they knew him like most unbelievers, that Jesus came and left. I, he was a good teacher, and he did good things, and he was, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar. I, I've gone to, Ron, I've gone to church. I know, um, I know about Jesus. Yeah, but you know him personally. Yeah. Do you know what he came to earth for? Do you know what part of your life he died for? I said that to, the other day to a person. They went, wait a minute. What part of my life did he die for? I said, yeah. Well, he said, I don't know. I, well, we do believe he died, didn't we? Yeah. And rose from the dead. Yeah, we, we, we believe that. Well, what, do you, what do you think? What part of you did he die for? And, he, and he, he couldn't come up with a good reason. I said, well, think about it. Maybe if you can't come up with an answer today, come on by tomorrow and we'll have coffee and you would talk some more about it. Because it, I mean, it would over, it overwhelm them. He, he was trying to think of a part of his life that Christ would die for, which he didn't realize it was what? All of it. I was going to tell him that. I wanted him to come to that. And so he said, well, I can't think what one part of it was. I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm here at Chick-fil-A every day from Monday through uh, Friday. Just come on in and let's talk about it. See, what was I doing? Sowing a seed, wasn't I? 
All he's doing is just, if I'd have given him the answer, he went away, oh yeah, he, you're trying to trick me or something. See how great a love? See, I don't know that we understand how great a love it is. How great a love it was that God sent his only begotten son out of heaven to die on a cruel cross for us sinners to take our wrath, to take the wrath of God upon him. That, that's a pretty powerful idea. In uh, 1 John, again, into 1 John 4, 9 through 10, by, by this, the, watch this now. Good. Sometimes you, you miss stuff. I, want, I don't want you to read the Bible. I want you to do what? Study it. Pay attention. Let the Holy Spirit show you stuff. For example, by this, now watch this. He says, by this the love of God was manifested in us. That. See, by this, he's, he, he, he's using it as a pointer to something. He's used this, by this, in the Greek language, he's He's using it as a pointer to something. By this, he's got a pointer on you. The love of God was manifest that God, here's the pointer, by this, the love of God was manifested in whom? In us. That God sent his only begotten son into the world. Right? Here, here's part two. Here's part two. So that we might live through him. This is love. Did you get the two parts? Oh, my, my, my. You missed the two parts. Uh oh. Remember the pointer? By this, the love of God was manifested in us. One, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world. Two, so that we might live through him, this, and this is love. You got it? Well, there's two parts of this love of God business. There's one part that God loved us so much when we were sinners, he sent his son to die on the cross so we would have access. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, you get saved. When you, The moment you get saved, the love of God is poured out within your heart. That you belong to God and God loves you from that day, will love you for every day of your life for eternity. Because you accepted his son, he will always love you because you accepted his gift to you. That gift of grace, salvation he gave you. And he will always respect the fact that you believed it. Now watch, the second half of that verse is where the rubber hits the pavement for you. That we, look, by this the love of God was manifested in us, one, that God sent his only begotten Son of the world, so that we might live through him. We, we, we might what? Wait a minute. Live how? Through him. How many of us do really do that? How many of us really live through Christ in our daily life? Well, I'll tell you, my son-in-law, Widgeon, I, I deserve the Widgeon having a name like Adama. I deserve that. He said to me one day, I said, every day he charts everything he did that day before he goes to bed. And he's been doing it ever since he got saved. He got saved like 10. I said, every day? He went, yeah. I said, why do you do that? He said, it's the most magnificent journey I go back and I look at my elementary school books that I wrote. What a journey I've had. What a life I've had in Christ, Ron. I go back and I look at my high school books. 
See, he, he don't have, what, what do we call that uh, when we get our senior books? What, what's that? Yeah, with our pictures and that. Uh, yeah. He has them on how God worked in his life. And he records everything. He writes everything down. Uh, I don't know if he, how many, but I see him at night doing it. And he has a quiet time. He writes everything down. I may do it at lunch. I don't know. But he writes everything down. And he said, I go back and I look and I see how God has walked me through my life. It's the most amazing journey. I forget that stuff. I forget what I did in grammar school. And every once in a while, I work with, he works with grammar kids. He goes back and he sees those kids struggling with their little lives, trying to figure it out. Their parents getting divorced and all this kind of stuff. And they're going through struggles in their life. He's got everybody writing little journals on their life to see the dynamics of God. So I started doing that. I went like, yeah, and I've encouraged you to do it. It's never too late. It's never too late. And I'm telling you, it's an amazing thing to see how God shows up and shows out in your life. See, you only remember a little bit of the, the hills and the valleys and all that. You don't see where God was in all of it. And uh, he writes the good, bad, and ugly. I said, well, you keep them under lock and key, I guess. Uh, I can't imagine a whole lot of ugly with him, but uh, who knows. Uh, so next week, Next week, I'm, I'm going to carry this a little further, this idea of love, uh, because Paul, Paul really made a big deal out of it, didn't he? In, in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, he said, here are, here are three pillars of the Christian life, faith, hope, and love. And he said, the greatest pillar of them all is love. 